Gina. Ah, yeah. We're expecting the producer price inflation this week on Thursday, and we saw it last month come in on 6.6%. You know, with um, interest rates moving one way, the oil price moving another, you know, the key drivers not moving in the same direction. What do we expect here? Well, we're actually expecting a further moderation. And the reason being is that, you know, if you look at that currency commodity price trade off, the commodity prices are really winning in, in, in the fact that they're declining at a far more rapid rate than the currency. If you look at the currency since March, the Rand dollars um, depreciated 7%, but the oil price has come down 17%. Now, all that means is that in Rand terms, commodity prices, especially those that we import, are starting to come down in price. And I think that disinflationary effect is likely to show up in the PPI number. We think a number close to 6.2% is likely, which of course will fuel all those discussions and debates about what's being priced in as far as a rate cut um, can be expected. So we saw the inflation rate coming in lower than we expected last week. Mm. All this drivers, the producer price inflation coming low, in, if, if it does, like you expect. Can we see another moderation into the inflation rate there? Well, we do expect so. I think if you look at CPI, um, we're now expecting it to remain actually within the target band over the foreseeable future, which would be the forecast period also of the Reserve Bank. And I think that also helps. You know, it's one thing to be trying to tackle high inflation that would be out of the, the target band when you're also trying to tackle what seems to be downside risks to growth at the moment. But it does make the job of the Reserve Bank a little bit easier if inflation is looking to be more contained. And I think looking over coming months, we'll CPI particularly, those petrol price cuts are certainly going to help add downside pressure. And then food inflation, that's also, it's a bit of a um, jackpot at the moment because although meat prices uh, decline quite strongly at the beginning of the year, at some point farmers are going to be replenishing their stocks, which means that meat supply will go down and eventually the price of meat will come up. But of course, at the same time, grain prices are now coming down, which could offset some of this. I think if you put it all together, it's very safe to say that the path for inflation does at least look contained for now, which helps when growth looks like it has downside risks and you have to make interest rate decisions down the line. So if I listen to you and the whole story that you're driving now, you don't expect any cut in the, in the interest rate coming from the Reserve Bank? We don't expect a cut, but we also don't expect a hike. So we're expecting rates to remain at unchanged levels, 5.5% for repo currently, until the end of 2013. And the reason being is that although inflation can be tolerated now that it's contained, it is still sitting at the top end of the target band. But at the same time, there are downside risks to growth. It's not to say the risks aren't there of a rate cut. And I certainly think that if you look at the FRA pricing, there is perhaps a little bit too much being priced in. The probability is sitting at about 75%. But of course, if the world becomes a lot poorer, um, well, poorer as far as growth rates goes, um, and then of course it starts to impact South Africa, and South Africa starts to slip to an area where manufacturing exports starts to actually decline. That may mean job shedding, and job shedding would kick the legs out of the one thing really helping to support growth, and that would be the consumer. And that brings us to credit extension that we yes. also see on <laughs> Friday. We saw we only added about 5,000 jobs in, in the first quarter, which is not significant if you look on a statistical basis. Mm. What can we expect from the credit extension? Do you so see it actually improving? We, we do see it improving slightly, and that's only because we think that the April number was really held back by the school holidays. So in other words, not many people go out and take out a mortgage advance over that time because a lot of them are on holiday. But even so, even if it does lift above 8% growth as we expect, it's still not doing anything spectacular. And I think what the credit data is actually starting to show us is that there is a debate about asset-backed credit, which would be mortgages and, of course, installment credit versus non-asset-backed credit, which is, of course, the theme everyone's talking about at the moment, that discretionary aspect of unsecured lending, credit cards, and overdrafts. It's not just about unsecured lending growing very quickly at the moment. Credit cards are well into double digits, as are overdrafts. And I think that also speaks to the fact that mortgage advances it's not much appetite out there. Not many people have a deposit to put down on a mortgage advance at the moment. And then of course, if you look at the unsecured lending, well perhaps that does help to do exactly that. Okay, finally, I just want to t um, ch touch on that fact that you mentioned mm. the mortgages not, not growing as we want them to grow. And we know that's the investment we need for sustainable economic growth to come through. 
the on the other side the unsecured lending that's not actually going to be sustainable and especially if we look at the, the clients of Capitec having about 35 percent of those clients already have unsecured lending facilities at other um, um, offer offers of, mm -hmm. of that lending so do you do you think that we you know, the economy is going to grow strong enough for us not to see a downside on the interest rate coming from that sector. Well, I do think that, you know, when it comes to unsecured lending, an interest rate discussion isn't really the, the correct way of looking at it because unsecured lending is as far as I understand, most of it is at fixed rates. So when you start talking about the risks around unsecured lending, high inflation and job loss is the biggest risk there. Thank you, Gina. That was Gina Skuman, economist at APSA Capital.